So thanks for joining us again, Dr. Cooper Smith. Um, I think today we wanted to address uh, something that comes up a lot, which is steroids and sepsis. Okay, sounds good. So there are really, um, it's simplest to think about this in the sepsis, formerly severe sepsis, and septic shock. So it's incredibly straightforward to go through um, sepsis that is no pressures. Do you know what the literature on that is? Well, don't do it, right? Yeah, that's, it can be summarized in one sentence. So there, are, historically we've always recommended don't do it, and then a few weeks ago a paper came out in JAMA called the High Press Study. Because again, to publish in the top journal, what do you need? A good acronym. A good acronym. Um, the high press isn't that great, which is maybe why it wasn't in one journal of medicine. Uh, but the high press study came out looking at um, steroids in what was called severe sepsis or sepsis, depending on which definition you use, and it shows no benefit. Okay. So we can just get rid of that one incredibly simply. If you have a patient with septic, with organ function dysfunction, and they're not impressors, don't use steroids. There's no role for them whatsoever unless somebody's previously on steroids. I haven't read the paper. Is there a, an increased mortality or just there's no benefit? There's no benefit. Okay. Um, so as we're about to go into the septic shock, so there are a bunch of downsides to steroids, right? So what are the downsides to steroids? Um, well, it's obviously immunosuppressive. Mm -hmm. um, it can have endocrine effects, so, and also uh, increase your, decrease your ability to handle sugar, glucose, processed sugar. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, right. Tissue so, integrity, wound healing, et cetera. Right. Uh, two other ones to think about. Um, so every one of those is right. Uh, for a small percentage of people, that can cause steroid-induced psychosis. Sure. And then one which a lot of people don't know and may or may not be relevant is an interaction with uh, muscle relaxants. So if you paralyze somebody and you put them on steroid together, their chance of having significant critical uh, myopathy, that is basically being unable to move their body for the next six months, goes up 16-fold. So it's not a minor one. So going and knowing that steroids do have side effects. So there is a concept that when somebody goes into septic shock, they're adrenally insufficient. And there's two and only really two large studies in these. There's multiple meta-analyses, but the truth is the meta-analyses are taken up almost exclusively by these two studies. Um, so the first study was published in JAMA. It did not have an acronym, actually. Everybody calls it the study by Jalali Anand, uh, who is the first author. And what it showed, do you remember what it showed? Or do you want me to go into it? Um, I don't remember that particular paper. Okay. Sorry. So it showed that if you start somebody on steroids and the dose was 50 milligrams Q6 hours of hydrocortisone, they also used FluorNF, which nobody does anymore. They also used a cartridge stimulation test, which nobody does anymore. Um, but they showed that if you start steroids for people in septic shock mm -hmm. um, who are on pressors, despite adequate fluid resuscitation, and I'll get to one subtle distinction in a bit, that mortality went down from 60% to 50% with no side effects whatsoever. So there was a one week fixed course. So four times a day, they got hydrocortisone and no complications one week and mortality went down drastically. So that's a 10% absolute risk reduction and a fairly significant relative risk reduction. And how many things do we have right now for sepsis that unequivocally improve outcomes? Just antibiotics. Antibiotics, like nothing. Yeah. So we have a million trials, not a million, but 150 or 200 uh, clinical trials and nothing unequivocally improves outcomes. So if we truly have something that gives you a relative, an absolute risk reduction of 10%, yeah, that's really, huge yeah. and you unequivocally do that. So going back to when I was a junior attending, uh, we used to do cautious stimulation tests on everybody. Everybody failed, I would say 80 to 90% of people failed mm -hmm. and we started everybody on steroids. And we did the one week and it turns out that the one week is not recommended anymore even if you do it because people have rebound on Addison's disease if, you, uh, if they're still on pressors. And so we don't say one week fixed anymore. We actually now talk about weaning if you're gonna do steroids. And they did, because I worked in a surgical ICU at the time, a lot of people had problems with wound healing. Um, so at the time, if you were in the early 2000s, everybody got put on steroids because everybody failed their stem test because of this one prospective randomized trial study published in JAMA. So can you just remind me really quickly about the trial? Was mm -hmm. it people who were on what was the definition? What was their definition of shock at that time? So the definition, and it was intentionally vague, and this is going to get into the next trial I talk about. 
um, talked about an, being on pressors that didn't talk about a dose, but it said an inability to maintain hemodynamic stability despite being on pressors. Okay, so, so vague about in number of pressors. Very, and... very vague. Okay. And I would make an argument, I don't even know what that means because the truth is I can dial up pressors and I can get you to a map of 65. And if I cannot get you to a map of 65 to being on, despite being on maximum dose pressors, you are about to die. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows what that means. But that is the one key wording which is going to become relevant in a minute. Okay. So the second large trial is a trial called Corticus. And because it does have an acronym, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, the first study, the non study, came from France, and the Corticus trial also came from Europe. And they used the identical entry criteria, with the one exception being they didn't talk about an inability to um, maintain blood pressure despite pressors. They didn't talk about hemodynamic instability. You could still, you know, everybody was still on pressors, everybody was still in septic shock. That was the only subtle difference. That becomes relevant because the baseline mortality in the Corticus trial was 25%. So the baseline mortality in the Anon study was 60%, and the Corticus trial, the baseline mortality was 25%. And after giving steroids, the follow-up mortality was what? Slightly less than 25%. No, exactly 25%. Okay. There was no difference at all. And there was an, a problem with all the side effects of steroids. There was a problem with glucose control, there was a problem with long-term outcomes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so you have two opposing studies. And right now, these are the only two studies. There will be another study coming out. Again, Jalal Anand, who did the first one, has finished enrolling another study, which I thought was going to be out by now, isn't, so I don't actually know when it's going to be out. So right now, we really only have two studies. If you look at, you can look at meta-analyses, but meta-analyses can show you whatever you want. Right. The person who likes the first study does a meta-analysis that highlights the first study, the person who likes the second study, uh, it's the second study, so you can find a meta-analysis to say the steroids are really beneficial, and you can find a meta-analysis to say the steroids aren't. Functionally, there's two large studies. And then you have the surviving sepsis wording, which is a negative wording, which was written by somebody who likes to write election day ballot issues. Um, because you have to really pay very close attention because it says, do not use steroids if you are able to maintain hemodynamic stability through a combination of fluids and pressors, which is inscrutable uh, because they're gonna get to the same difference in entry criteria. But basically, you can take all this and put it down to really simply, because we only, only have two studies. If your baseline mortality is 60%-ish, mm -hmm. so if you say you think somebody has a one in two chance of dying, then it's totally appropriate, based upon existing literature, to say that person's appropriate to start on steroids. If you think your person is sick, on pressors, but has a significantly lower chance of dying, a 25% chance of dying, you have literature to support that you should not do it. And so you take that together and you look at the surviving sepsis recommendations, and ultimately it says, if you're sort of sick, reasonably sick, what anybody else in the real world would think of as sick, one in four chance of dying, that's not so sick, that's not so unstable, steroids are not beneficial. You're gonna have all the downside and none of the upside. If you're crazy sick, one in two chance, a little bit higher chance of dying, then they have a prospective randomized trial saying, you should start steroids. And then if you do it, you start them on hydrocortisone 50Q6. Um, the most recent surviving sepsis, and if anyone wants people look at this, there'll be another surviving sepsis in a month or two. The most recent one talks about a continuous steroid drip. Um, and because of area under the curve and the such, that is unlikely to be in the next one and almost nobody does it. So I mentioned that in case somebody looks at the 2012 mm -hmm. surviving sepsis, but if you go to your hospital and say, wait a second, we don't do that, that's okay, nobody does that. Um, and Flornef, which was part of the original protocol, yeah, is that? not mentioned because nobody could come up with a good physiologic rationale why wow. it was beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, and it will specifically talk about number one, not stopping steroids until somebody is off of pressors. And if it's a short course, three or four days, you can just stop them at three or four days. You don't have to go on for okay. the full week. And if it is a longer course, you would actually taper them. So if you have somebody who's on pressors for an extended period of time, 10 days, 14 days, you wouldn't just stop them, you would then taper them. Mm -hmm. There are no clear data about the best way to taper. Anecdotally, I can tell you that I have stopped, stopped somebody cold turkey after the first study came out, we always did seven days because that's what the study said. And then we saw 
what would happen if you stop steroids and somebody's not ready to stop steroids? What happens to their electrolytes? Oh, they go all out of whack. Um, you get <clears throat> Uh, sodium abnormalities, potassium abnormalities. Exactly right, and that's what yeah. and that's what happened when when the sodium and potassium went like this. We're like, hey, what's going on? And we realized, oh, we stopped the steroids. Yeah. And so I do have personal anecdotal experience in that you're not supposed to do medicine by anecdote, um, but I can tell you it really does happen. But the the recommendations now are while you're in pressers, you keep the steroids on. If it's a short course, you just stop them. If it's a so longer course, on that note, though, them. is that all the effect that you saw? You didn't see like rebound hemodynamic instability or anything like that. Um, you do, but it gets to be a little bit more challenging to figure out. So okay. what's clear in all the studies is steroids decrease the amount of time that you're on pressors um, and decrease the amount of pressors that you're on. Mm -hmm. But And so you can even easily have a rebound there. But at the end of the day, you might think that's a good thing, right, to decrease the amount of pressors you're on or decrease the amount of time you're on pressors. But you're essentially using a secret presser. Exactly right. So you're not you're not squeezing the blood vessels, but effectively you're using a secret presser. And it gets down to the same thing. When you have something with ARDS, your goal is not to improve oxygenation. Your goal is to improve survival. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things that improve oxygenation, nitric oxide, that doesn't improve survival. We talked about this last time with pressers. There's a million things that can get your blood pressure up to a map of 65. Sure. If you have a gunshot and you're bleeding out, if you start somebody in a levofed drip, they will bring <laughs> their map up to 65 transiently, but it's not going to help their outcome. So yeah, in the sense that steroids are acting as a, as a secret presser. So it does get you off pressures quicker, it, it diminishes your dose, and if you rebound, yes, you might go back on, uh, doesn't really functionally change outcome. So for people who are in the in-between, not don't fall into, they have a one in four chance of dying, but mm -hmm. they have a one in two chance of dying, who are neither here nor there, they are critically ill, but have been critically ill for maybe two weeks or so, mm -hmm. and you are on just baby dose of the presser, you cannot get off of that, and you are on steroids, do those people have a higher likelihood of being on steroids the rest of their lives, or how does that sort of transition work? No, so there, so you're not going to, so people call this stress dose steroids, and it's actually a misnomer. Okay. So do you have, this is going to get a little bit far off the field, do you have any idea where the concept of stress dose steroids started? Um, was it kind of an uh, operative thing, people who actually have uh, underlying endocrine disorders? It was an operative thing. So there were two people who got started on high who got started on high-dose steroids in the 1960s, who both died. And after that, there was this concept of crazy high-dose steroids for a long period of time that were called stress-dose steroids, that if somebody was on anything before surgery, they got put on massive doses of steroids. People started calling that stress-dose steroids. We don't do that anymore because it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. And then somehow that morphed into calling 50Q6 of hydrocortisone stress-dose steroids. Which is not, right? Which is not. It's actually physiologic, physiologic. dose. And so if you had a bilateral <clears throat> adrenalectomy for a fetal chromocytoma, the amount of steroid that you would give to make up what your body normally makes is 50Q6. So it's actually physiologic steroids. Um, and you are not going to, being critically ill does not give you lifelong Addison's disease. And so if you survive your critical illness, you will get off steroids. Now it's possible if you're one of those people who's on steroids just a whiff for a long period of time and your vascular tone never gets better, mm -hmm. You know, it's possible that you might get them off. You're not going to keep them on. You, they might stay on steroids for a while, and that may be paid for for a while. Um, it might be that somebody you give oral steroids to. But your critical illness is not predictive of you needing this sort of thing. Critical illness does not give you long. It, the only way you blow out your adrenals is like in pregnancy, hemorrhage, you know, yeah. right? If you hemorrhage into your yeah. adrenals. But if you survive your critical illness, you will not just like if you are going dialysis and you survive six months later you're very unlikely to be on dialysis mm -hmm. if you go on steroids six months later you're very unlikely to be on steroids okay it is a short your body is perturbed this is your adrenally insufficient for that period of time even though frankly if you look at the we don't do the court stimulation tests anymore but when we did it was interesting do you know who had the worst outcomes of patients i understand you've probably never done a course stimulation test in your life I don't know who had the worst outcome. It was the people who had the highest level of cortisol and they didn't stem. And so it was, okay. it was, a, it was, everybody thinks of adrenal insufficient as somebody who, if you draw the cortisol level, is less than 10. Uh -huh. So it's almost undetectable. You say they've got no cortisol in their body and then you stimulate them. They're supposed to go up. They don't go up and you say, ah, they've got a primary problem and they can't respond. So they've got a major problem. It turns out the ones who are busting out maximum, maximum doses of cortisol, the ones who are levels were 40 or 50, those are the ones who actually did the worst they had by far the highest mortality. Um, 
Because we're not supplementing them, right? We're not giving them back. Any they actually, food. they actually did get supplemented. Oh, did they, they? they didn't go up by. We don't check stim tests anymore, uh -huh. um, but they would never go up. So the people who are maximally stimulated who couldn't go any further, so they had cortisol levels uh -huh. of forty-five or fifty, uh -huh. and you stim them and they couldn't go any further. We used to start them because they <clears> didn't <throat> respond, and then they all died anyway. Mm. Um, so probably we're now getting into things that our listenership doesn't care about at all. Um, and so we can probably bring this down into an incredibly simple bottom line, which is, number one, if you're crazy sick, and eh, starting steroids is an appropriate thing. What counts as crazy sick? Because I said 50% mortality, and you're likely not gonna sit there and calculate your Apache score and say, okay, based on a population basis, what counts as crazy sick? So if you're looking for a good surrogate for crazy sick, if you're starting a second presser. Right. Um, and that's the local culture at Emory we actually did and published on this, a survey of all the attendings and APPs here of what constitutes somebody starting a presser. And almost everybody was um, starting starts, almost everybody was starting a second presser. So if you have somebody that you know, they're almost always gonna be an event. And so it's gonna be at least two organ failures, but only three or four. Mm -hmm. And you're starting them on a second presser, that's somebody who's really, really sick. And that's somebody who the literature would suggest benefits from steroids. If you have somebody who's on one presser and they're not all that sick, and I understand to the family they're incredibly sick, but to us, you're like, you know what, this person's gonna do okay. That person probably shouldn't get. And assuredly, people in shock don't get um, steroids at all. You give them the thing and you dose it until they're off pressers. If they get off quickly, you just stop it. If they don't, you taper. That's all you need to know. What if they're on chronic steroids at home? If they're on chronic steroids at home, then you will start them on 50Q6 and you will basically keep them on 50Q6 essentially throughout their entire ICU course. And long after they are off pressers, your friends in the endocrine team who will be involved um, will write for a, a long um, wean to go back to where they are. I mean, maybe if they're on pressers for a day, that's not the case. Um, but they will always put them on 50Q6. So they're not gonna put them on super stressed dose. They're gonna put them on physiologic dose. They're gonna keep them that for a while because when you're in the ICU, you're sick enough to be physiologically perturbed. That's not the time to say, hmm, we've got underlying Addison's disease and let's see if they're really back to their baseline or not, because that's when you would certainly have the, um, the rebound. So you just put them on 50Q6 and you're just, you're good. And endocrine on the back end will start weaning them. Okay, would you say that in any patient on chronic steroids with concern for sepsis, who just, just start 50Q6 even if they're not on pressors? I would not. I go back to the statement that there are no data whatsoever for, start, for steroids in currently called sepsis, previously called severe sepsis. So if you're not on pressors, from the sepsis standpoint, there are no data to suggest that you should be on more steroids. Now, if you're working with an endocrinologist and they say from the endocrinology standpoint, from the Addison standpoint, the physiologic perturbations are the such that they should be on more steroids just because of the stress involved, that's fine. But sepsis in the absence of shock what you're generally doing when you're giving steroids, it's not so simple, but I like the way Priya put it, it's not a presser, but it's functionally acting as a presser. Um, and so you would not typically do that.